Crimson Wheel. And uh, I think this is fantastic. Oh. Uh, and very timely that we're, we're kicking off, thank you, Josh, uh, the sort of uh, reignition of the Infrastructure Committee with a series about parks, as yesterday would have been the 200th birthday of uh, Olmsted, who I'm sure we're all familiar with, is sort of the, uh, the father of the <coughs> Nexus and uh, one of sort of the giants of landscape architecture in America. Um, Boston has a rich legacy of parks that are sort of quote unquote more than meets the eye. Uh, Olmsted's project in the Back Bay Sands, as much as it was a respite from the city and a chance to reconnect with nature in an urban environment, was also fundamentally an infrastructure project at its core, uh, allowing for the um, draining and development of the Back Bay Fens and to control flooding along what was the Stony Brook River at that point. So uh, it's as much um, happening below ground as there is above ground. And you know, parks are still on the front line of protecting urban areas, especially from uh, issues regarding and related to water. Uh, the focus now perhaps being less about sort of draining land for development and more of a focus on sea level rise, uh, stormwater events, and a lot of the sort of negative externalities uh, due to climate change. Um, in, in addition to that, as, as much as parks are an element of resiliency, uh, they're also a public health intervention. And uh, I think Olmsted, and for a lot of their legacy, they've been thought of as the lungs of the city, that's how Central Park has been referred to as, but that's taken on a deep new meaning in the COVID era. Uh, parks have provided access to fresh air. They've been one of the few safe spaces where people can uh, collect and gather and meet in what have been really challenging times. And so I think their their value to society has is understood in a deeper and much more fundamental way uh, due to the pandemic. And uh, to transition, you know, we can only really understand the value then of parks uh, in our open spaces if we understand the, the multitude of functions uh, that they perform. And that's what I think is really exciting about this session and our speakers today is that they're going to start to speak to um, all the aspects of design of our open space and urban environment in Boston uh, and in ways that, that we may not be able to understand simply by inhabiting those spaces. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, from Weston and Samson both uh, Sherry Ruane and Julia Eaton Ernst. Uh, Sherry Ruane is a Vice President and uh, Discipline Leader of the Design Program at Weston and Samson, where she oversees professionals focused on landscape architecture and aquatic design. Uh, she received her master's degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Design and has consciously chosen to focus her career in the public realm. So welcome, Sherry. And then joining her is uh, Julia Eaton Ernst. Um, Julia uh, is a um, professional engineer and the climate resilience leader at Wesson and Sampson. Um, she is an MVP certified provider and responsible for providing targeted engineering services related to resiliency including the identification of flexible, engineered, and adaptable strategies. Julie routinely uh, leads interdisciplinary projects and has special expertise with translating climate projections into design standards and implementing resilience across planning and design projects. And she's currently the chair of the EBC Climate Change and Air Committee, and her favorite resiliency projects are parks. So apropos that she is with us today. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Sherry and Julie and look forward to their presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe let's see in terms of logistics. I will stop my share and start right. a share. Start my share. And then do do we want to pass, we can pass this laptop around if you guys would prefer to have a kind of that feature view as well. Uh oh, I see what you're saying. Sure. Um, you know what? We're going to bounce back and yeah, forth, it's so it might be. be a little, okay. yeah, we'll spare everyone the close-up of our, I didn't have the hair and makeup staff today, but <laughs> so we'll just skip that. Sounds good. Then I'll turn mine up. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, should I start? Yeah, that's great. Right. Yeah. So, in full disclosure, we didn't, um, you know, script out every single slide, but Julie and I have given a presentation like this probably a hundred times and so while you're in good hands it'll be a little bit more um, agile we'll say organic oh, yeah organic right pretty flowing um, so Weston and Sampson is a 700 person um, interdisciplinary organization that 
um, aspires to have offices up and down the East Coast. We're getting there, as you can see from the yellow states. But we do offer pretty much everything that you see listed on the right or in the center of the slide. And I'll say that for us, for Julie and I, um, this means that we get access to projects that are really complicated and um, often in the public realm, as noted, and really give us um, tricky problems that both of us love to solve. And so as we have evolved as a practice, landscape architecture has been a part of West Bend Sampson since January 1st, 2000. And Julie started the Resiliency Group. Um, what may only be, was it? 2017. Yeah. Special. Okay, five years ago, but feels like 500 years ago because we've been through so much since then. That, um, you know, I think the more complicated the, pro the problem, the more fun and exciting it is as a solution that we work on design with. So, um, yeah, so just head to the next one. Um, I think I talked about a lot of this. We do, I will say this, um, as we are evolving as a company, it has been really clear, as, as was anyone I'm sure that's on this call and has been talking about um, what makes a great organization is that um, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access has become really a cornerstone of how we operate and it's taken a lot of soul searching. We were founded in 1899, so there was a lot of this is how we've always done it and we're, we're, a, we're a business of engineers to um, actually know that's not true. <laughs> and so that's been a big part of the last few years of our evolution, as well as integrating resilience into every single one of our projects and services. Um, so just we'll quickly talk a little bit about how what we've observed over the, over the recent maybe five to 10 years is that cities and towns are starting to realize that parks are critical infrastructure. They always have been, but I think the realization that they are is coming more to the fore. And I think that, um, you know, during the pandemic, parks and open spaces were absolutely critical to quality of life, where people couldn't gather indoors, they were, they were going to their public parks and open spaces. And also, they're a super critical part of how cities and towns are defending against rising tides, increasing heat, um, and intensity of storms, because they are, in some cases, the last bastion of undeveloped land that still has permeability and flexibility in how they are shaped. So in this image, this is in Springfield, Massachusetts, um, you know, looking at how parks are now being leveraged as resilient barriers, but knowing that we have this suite of opportunities here, which is to protect, to accommodate, or to retreat. Parks can do all of those things, help facilitate all of those things in uh, some of the most important um, and densely populated areas in the country. Next. Um, I think as most people know, public health and open space go hand in hand. And as Brian said at the outset, you know, Olmsted knew that people needed respite from the city, and it wasn't just um, to provide, you know, trees that helped clean air. It was getting people out of their building or the courtyard or the street and into these open spaces. And now we're in an age where doctors are actually prescribing access, you know, people to be out in nature instead of medication in some cases. And I think Julia Africa, who is a um, biophilist and um, really smart uh, person who's contributed to a lot of these conversations around ecology and nature and the impact on public health, um, who contributed to an op-ed that we had in the Boston Globe about the importance of parks in the pandemic, um, also is a great resource, but just noting that how people engage with nature can truly move the needle on their mental and physical well-being. And I think that, that those of us in the business, that's obvious, but I think more and more people are understanding that it's absolutely mission critical to high quality of life. Um, and not only for sort of the health benefits, but also social benefits and an ability where people truly can occupy space um, with ease, with being welcomed, with being 
truly considered as these spaces are being designed and what it means to be inclusive well beyond you know, ADA guidelines or well beyond sort of a, any checklist clients might have, really making these places feel welcoming to all. And the design of those spaces, frankly, in, I think informs how people operate um, in their cities and towns. And so uh, we take great pride in informing a lot of those conversations and listening and leading how those evolve. Um, I'll just add, like, there, it's fun. Like, there's so much joy that parks bring out. And, you know, I'm, I have a 16-month-old daughter now, and we didn't get to really do much in the pandemic because we were shuttered inside. But, you know, we're planning her first, quote-unquote, first one-and-a-half birthday at a splash pad in our public park, like, where we can gather safely. And, you know, it's an area I learned about it through my neighbors. Like, oh, we take our kids there. It really is sort of that social network of right. where do you go, where do you gather, how do you connect with your community? It's at the park. Right. And I think that all, this whole narrative contributes to the fact that parks are critical infrastructure. And I think, you know, the way that we look at infrastructure a lot of the time is water, sewer, electricity, and all of those networks have rate pairs. So, you know, you pay a water and a sewer bill and you pay your electric bill. You don't pay a parks bill. And so developing um, a stream of revenue that allows for the support, the ongoing maintenance and operation of these spaces, in addition to the design, the aspirational design and construction of spaces that go well beyond what may be a typical, you know, some people's minds park, is important. And different cities and towns are looking towards new income streams. You know, for a while it was the Uber and the Airbnb and the um, other disruptive technologies that were an opportunity for new income streams. I was recently visiting a college campuses with my son, um, which is terrifying. And we were on this college campus that was absolutely stunning. The, the landscape was stunning. And I sort of mentioned it to the tour guide. I was like, I have to say, you know, we've all been on college campuses, but the maintenance and the attention to the site is tremendous. And you said every parking ticket, the revenue goes to the operation and maintenance of the, everything outside the building. And I was like, genius, right? <laughs> How many admissions in our tours are like, wow, this is an amazing campus. I could see myself here. You know, it was. That sort of thinking has to come into play, I think, as we think about um, our parks and open spaces. You want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think as we're looking at parks, often we see what's above the ground surface. We see the, you know, joy in the splash pad. We see the beautiful space where you want to picture yourself on a college campus. Um, but it can be more than that, and it, you know, when a lot of times we're thinking about protection, we're thinking about walls and, and barriers, and, you know, if anyone has seen the city of Boston's plans for the resilient harbor vision, you know, it's all about bringing access to the waterfront, and so thinking about a barrier is more than a barrier, um, is really, you know, what, what are the opportunities that we have in parks to make them resilient and make them still spaces? Um, and creating that equitable access. So, you know, this is an example of the park, uh, Langone, Langone Park and Popolo Playground um, in the North End. Um, it was the site of the Great Molasses Flood, uh, but this was an opportunity for the city of Boston to test out their climate resilient design standards and guidelines to protect rights of way. Um, and we worked with them to come, to come up with a solution where we couldn't just raise the seawall. The, the condition of the existing seawall was variable, long history of Boston still and evolution on the site of the, the park itself. But we came up with sort of a cantilevered solution that allows you to still have that access um, while having that wall and sort of showing that the park itself is beautiful. I encourage you, especially now that the weather is getting nicer, to you know, walk through, enjoy sit out and look at the harbor on um, this beautiful decking, but you know, below ground there's so much happening here and you can even see in the lower right hand corner there's stormwater happening too on the site. You know, you can see our stormwater um, happening underneath the, the now playground. Um, so when we're talking about climate resilience, I thought I'd just kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, generally we're looking at, we talk about sea level rise and storm surge 
extreme precipitation, so you know more frequent, more intense rainfall, and extreme heat events. So we're seeing a general trend in warmer temperatures, but also more extreme events. Uh, there are many other climate impacts, but um, you know these are sort of the most the three primary that we have the most information, most model uh, projections on. So. What that looks like is we're modeling climate scenarios, we're assessing risk and developing plans and strategies. Um, then we're thinking about how we're designing projects to adapt and manage uncertainty in that we have projections. We have a range of possible futures, so what does that look like? And then really, as part of all, all projects that are looking at climate resilience, um, are that what are the natural systems that can be integrated in? And that's why parks are so great, is that they really prioritize nature and equity as part of the park design at the forefront, which makes them such incredible opportunities for climate resilience because they create additional value. Um, we're going to go over just a quick, like some case studies and then go into a little bit more examples to just dialogue. Um, if folks have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, can you monitor them, Josh? And like, let us know if we need to stop and go over anything. As Sherry said, this is going to be organic. Um, so many of you guys have seen this image before. Um, if you are in and around the city of Boston, this is from the 2017 report, Coastal Resilient Solutions for East Boston. That was the first climate-ready Boston report um, that looked at the risk of East Boston to sea level rise and storm surge. Um, so as you can see, East Boston is very vulnerable. Um, that's why they started there. Um, and one of the sites we'll just quickly jump into is Carlton Wharf. Uh, we are working with DPDA on technical analysis and resilient design to advance some strategies that came forward in that plan. Uh, so this is what it looks like right now. Uh, there is not much there. There is, you know, a few benches, some trees, a little bit of grass, uh, but as you can see it's heavily developed behind um, and there's not much of a shorefront. Um, so when we were sort of thinking about what are the opportunities here, you know, how do we activate this waterfront? How do we really um, promote this? The stretch of pavers that we see here is part of the harbor walk and that continuity. Um, so we worked closely with the community through series of charrettes and design strategies to think about what that could look like um, in that uh, right of way that exists. So maintaining, um, we have here in the dashed line, the flood alignment of itself, but sort of creating space ahead in front of the uh, flood barrier so you don't feel like you're walking up to a wall as well as behind to sort of uh, get people up and over that space. The benefit here was really that we had um, the space to do it, but as you can see, there's still a lot of existing utilities that are happening. So we're gonna have to be thinking about how this wall is spanning those below ground utilities, outfalls in the area, as well as keeping that continuity in the park and thinking about an adaptive waterfront. So what this would look like, as you can see here, during a future storm condition, um, the wall would be designed, I believe it was to the 1% 2070 flood event at 22.5 Boston City Base. Um, and we were, bent, we were lucky enough that this site we could tie into existing higher grades because the developers were thinking about, hey, we need to be thinking about our site. So all the new development that was happening, people were planning ahead. So it allows us to fill in these sections in public spaces. This is what it looks like as two sections here. Um, Sherry, I don't know if you want to talk to any of this. I think, yeah, I think in this particular case, the strategy was to actually create a barrier but then mitigate that the, you know, elevation through site-based interventions that help to bridge from, you know, existing at 15 um, up to the top of the wall at 22.5. And this, the approach to this varies. At Lango and Popolo, we actually had breaks in the flood barrier because we wanted people to get all the way to the water. But the site is graded in such a way that top of seawall matches back of site elevation. So the water, in, in general, the site is acting as a flood barrier. And the walls that you saw, those terrace feeding, that's more about wave attenuation and, and stopping sort of the force of the water. But we're fully anticipating that in some cases the site will be inundated, and that's okay. It was designed to accommodate that. In this case, the wall is consistent across the front, and then we've introduced other interventions to get people from neighborhood to water.
So this is an example of what that would look like, you know, the uh, nice rendering that we worked on with uh, staff or our partners on the project. You can see the dog park and sort of creating that, that urban edge. So it feels a lot more like a plaza on this side, you know, the harbor walk continuing. Um, but you can see that we're really focusing on areas in the bends of how to incorporate and integrate natural landscapes that can adapt over time. Um, so Sherry was mentioning, you know, we're going to sea level rise is going to happen um, incrementally over time. There are different uh, models to sort of project when we're going to see um, jumps in sea level rise, but we're looking at roughly four feet over the next 50 years. So looking at that, you know, not just in storm surge conditions, but what does that mean for migrating habitat? So being able to provide a space for nature to move inwards um, and really welcome and embrace nature and the water as part of the design while this determining, you know, where we want to cut off that line for storm surge. Um, and then thinking about, you know, no one wants to look up, you know, and see the back of a wall. So how do we, how can we benefit with uh, native gardens, green space, you know, gentle ramps that are accessible and friendly and don't obstruct the views. You know, people love walking along the water because they get the views. Uh, it's a beautiful view of the city of Boston skyline from this site. And so thinking about that as part of access. And I think too, um, and Julie, those last couple renderings, those were, like you said, in, in coordination with staff. And that is a common um, scenario that we're working with other design firms um, to really maximize the, the talent that we all bring to the table. Um, I'll say that, too, you know, so here there's this the barrier issue where you hear, if you're standing on the street, right, you do have to get up to to see over. And then in other places, we do have those breaks that you can, there's view sheds down to the water. Um, all of this has to be taken into consideration because it isn't as simple as the wall at the edge and call it a day. Um, all of that works in a way that, you know, gets buy-in and also helps keep the neighborhood and the waterfront knit together. Um, these native gardens and green space also serve as infrastructure. Um, water, generally our storm water flows towards the ocean, our groundwater flows towards the ocean. Um, so we need to be thinking about when we're putting a barrier that we're keeping coastal waters out, but we're also trapping stormwater in. Right. Um, so that's sort of where these, these spaces can also, um, while creating that, that benefit to the public realm, really serve to mitigate stormwater and um, heat, which I'll talk about as well. Um, so it's getting wetter, uh, rainfall, we're seeing, um, you know, today's 25 year storm event will be more like the 10 year storm event in the future and our 100 year storm event, so that one in 100 chance that we see it in a year will actually go to a 25 year storm event, a one in four chance that we'll see it in a year um, by in the, over the next 50 years. So that is means we're going to have to deal with a lot more water. Um, Ways that we can start thinking about that is really understanding where the water goes in our built environment. So um, we've been working uh, through the Charles River Flood Model Project, building resilience across the Charles River watershed on modeling what happens when we see storms and calibrating them with past storm events. Um, folks may remember the March 2010 storm events where there was a lot of flooding throughout the Commonwealth and sort of what that looks like so that we can figure out where um, where we need to invest um, green space and also where we need to think about relocating and readjusting our environment. Oh, I'm going to play it again. Is that good? Okay, hey, you see it twice. If you miss it once, you see it twice. Um, and then so through this model, we can start to see that um, the flood impact significant amounts of critical facilities um, in the watershed. So we looked at, again, that March 2010 storm as a calibration, um, but we can see that, you know, present 2030, 2070, we're seeing an increase, especially in the future, um, with more critical facilities being impacted. Um, so what does that mean? We know it's going to be wet. Um, it means that we have opportunities to really think about how we can build in green infrastructure into our built environment. Um, green infrastructure has numerous benefits and any nature-based solution does. Um, they do require maintenance, just like any other infrastructure, 
um, but thinking about ways that they can be part of the public realm and create that value, as well as being able to treat and manage stormwater um, quality and quantities. Yeah, and this is actually for 25 Medford um, in Charlestown, and uh, just working closely um, with the developer to identify ways that we can do those things, but also, you know, I think in some ways daylight them to help express that narrative. Again, this is reinforcing the fact that these open spaces, which of course have value in and of themselves, are also really important parts of a larger network that are managing uh, water, heat, et cetera. Um, the gr great part is that once we have a model developed, so once we understand where stormwater is going, we can start to model solutions. So we can actually see where our interventions will have um, the most impact. So this is an example from the existing Charles River flood model results viewer. Um, there's a link to it um, that's here on the screen if you guys are in the Charles River and want to check out to see what flooding looks like now and in the future and what types of green infrastructure solutions could be proposed. Um, but we can see here about we had um, roughly uh, three quarters of a foot of flooding before um, and then getting that less than a tenth of a foot um, in the future with green infrastructure solutions strategically placed. Um, so through this project, what was exciting is that um, we identified 15 priority projects in the watershed. Many of them involve parks and open space. And so that's sort of where people are seeing the opportunity of hey, we don't have this developed area. We have this space that we can manage with water. Sometimes it was left as open space for a reason in the sense that it used to flood all the time. So if they didn't want to build anything there, they left it be uh, natural. Um, but we're working on, you know, what are concepts over four sites that could provide um, an impact, not just locally, but to the larger um, watershed, sort of thinking that your park could actually have regional benefits outside of those local benefits for stormwater. And I think too, you know, conversations that we've had with like Boston Water and Sewer and MWRA, like you, ha you have to be careful because there's a perception that parks are left over and therefore available for just functionality. You know, when we had a lot of snow back in, mm. I think, in 2017 or 2016, Farms, you know, snow farms were like, oh, we'll put it in the parks. That was a terrible idea. It completely trashed the parks because in the snow are heavy metals and dog waste and petroleum and salt, and, and now it's dumped all over the parks. Like, it, we can't think about parks as these leftover voids that are, that are available to us. Really, it's about integrating those strategies in a way that does tell the story, is productive, and, and doesn't detract or does not compromise the very important intent of, um, you know, active and passive recreation. So that has to be kept paramount. And in some cases, you know, of course, Boston Water and Sewer, their mission is all around designing for the drop of water, right? And so they see a big <coughs> open park, like we were working with them on Harambe in Dorchester. They're like, oh, this is great, 60 acres, we can infiltrate so much. And we're like, oh, okay, slow, slow down, <laughs> it's not. It's not all available for infiltration. Yeah. So I think those conversations really, it's almost like you need the advocate for each and every one of those things to come to the table and come up with the right solution. Um, and it's not simply, you know, oh, it's so great. This was undeveloped and therefore available. No, I, right? It's, there's, there's potential there. So let's have a really productive conversation around how each of these priorities fit into a final solution. Um, the other sort of the the, um, the the one that gets left off the most, I think, is heat. Because when we look at heat projections, it's getting hot and it's getting hot everywhere. Um, but you know, while while we're seeing that increase in exposure, um, vulnerability isn't just based on exposure. It's also thinking about what the sensitivity and adaptive capacity are. And often, um, communities of color, communities of low income, vulnerable populations are really going to be impacted the most. Um, in densely urban environments where we already see urban heat island impacts. Um, so this is a project that we're working in Chelsea on urban heat island mitigation with some pilot projects in the community of identifying where are these hot spots in the community, where are people feeling them now, and knowing that as the number of hot days are going to increase, 
what does that mean? Um, I'll add a note here. You can see in the corner of the, the heat map, the land surface temperature map that's shown uh, the Mary O'Malley Park in that lower left corner. The park is not as hot, right? Like it's, it's intuitive that parks are not as um, hot. So when we're thinking about, again, this is a really densely um, populated uh, neighborhood. There's a lot of industrial use. You know, we, how do we think about parks as more than just a larger creation space, but parks is just part of our urban fabric. Um, and we can see that through things of reducing impervious areas, so just by reducing the impervious uh, surfaces, um, greater than 85% by reducing those 25%, we see a reduction in temperature. So we're able to model that and see, okay, like we can actually decrease the temperature, the observed temperature by just thinking about creating more porous um, surfaces and green space. And that's, and that is tricky. I mean, I have to say yeah. it's, it's, it's harder than just, oh, we'll reduce pavement, right? Yeah. <laughs> because as we look, we're, again, we're working with stuff on Mosley Park and Right now, it's a lot of athletic fields, some trees, and grass, and a stadium, right? It's a pretty basic um, program. It does flood. And one of the goals was to improve urban heat island conditions. Well, we're going from a lot of grass and trees to, like, more accessible, more usable. That's pavement in some cases. Or and turf. So, or turf, right, or synthetic turf. So actually, the material research of not only having it be pervious, but also having it be lighter in color or able to uh, mitigate some of the heat, exactly, the high reflectivity. It's almost like it's its own infrastructure network within the park is all of these surfaces that are contributing to or detracting from the heat load. That's a whole nother level of attention that must be paid as we move forward because with, if you're not mindful about it, the next thing you know, you're actually increasing heat load by putting in these really important interventions that are having an impact that was unintended. So I think all of these considerations need to be um, you know, concurrently considered and iterated as we move through design. Exactly. And this, the sort of the land surface temperature modeling doesn't think about do you have a splash pad or things yeah. like that. Like that's not part of the modeling, so it's great to have that, but the right. ambient land surface temperature is still hotter. hotter. Yeah. Um, thinking about targeted increase, so being specific of, okay, we have areas that have less than 15% of tree canopy, can we get it to 30%? So as you can see, we're not talking huge numbers in all cases, but trying to make that increase, um, and we can see that that as well has significant impact if we have it targeted. Um, with trees comes a lot of maintenance, a lot of talk with the communities as well. Um, and sort of who's taking care of those trees, who's watering those trees, who's getting those trees to survive, as well as um, public works where, you know, often if you have overhead lines, they don't want more trees because it causes delays in other utilities. So it's really, an, as Sherry's been saying, an ongoing conversation. It's not a one solution fits all. Right, right. It's not just plant the tree. Like, that's almost the easiest part, yeah. right? Just to plant it, right? <laughs> this is the easy part. Plant trees here, you yeah. know? <laughs> and then how you, right. Integrate that. Um, the good news is is that this is happening everywhere. Um, so that the things we've been talking about, you know, just an example, like Weston and Samson by ourselves, we've completed over a hundred climate resilience projects in the last five years. We've gotten our clients twelve million dollars in funding to do these projects. We've worked with over 50 communities on, you know, getting grant applications to see this through. Um, so the drive is there, the demand is there. It's no longer a, you know, kind of uh, for a long time it was just considered a buzzword, but it's real. This climate right. resilience is a real industry and a real practice, um, and the infrastructure that it's the infrastructure in part matters as part of that. I'll say this too, Julia. We talk with our communities um, that we work with about. Um, designing for resilience and parks, frankly, as, as a part of this network. Sometimes when we talk about 2070, people sort of glaze over, like, I am, I am going to be dead by then, right? Like, it, that is not of my immediate concern. And that's not to say that everyone just pushes it off. But there's merit in understanding that the narrative has to have an impact on us today. So the 2030 conversation or the 2050 conversation is far more impactful than the 2070. And while the 2070 numbers sort of get more people to be like, whoa, I think understanding that as we're de designing these infrastructure systems, 
they have to adapt yeah. as modeling changes and as new data becomes available. So these curves could change, like new things could come in that are going to impact these, and we need to be designing in a way that's adaptable for new data. So every time we consider a barrier as we're looking at that, we're designing it in a way that it could be added to if it needed to be, it could be adapted as we move forward, but we're going to design for what's most relevant in this moment, because certainly it's not worth we're going to spend $500 million on a flood barrier that's got us covered through 2100. Yeah. Like, that's not good use of public funds. And I think it's important, too, that often, so infrastructure, we have to invest in it. Parks, we have to invest exactly. in it. It's not a one time investment. Right. And if we're designing for conditions that something won't experience over general useful life, it's not a good investment. Right. Um, and right. so thinking through that really adaptive approach yeah. of how things can evolve and really what that looks like, that roadmap looks like. Yeah. Um, we're going to go over just a few examples to sort of comment through um, resilient open spaces. I know I, I, I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, but this is the Lewis Mall site in East Boston. Um, this is a very tricky site. Um, this is a, one of the first solutions. It was not the final preferred solution. Um, of where we had no room. We had 16 feet of public right-of-way and the MBTA head house is behind it. We need fire truck access. There is no room in that right-of-way and sort of thinking, what can that look like? How can you create space um, and still connectivity in the waterfront um, where there's just no room? And I'll say too, just quickly, I mean, yeah, to your point, we have, we should probably wrap up shortly, but um, another piece to this whole conversation is that right now regulators um, struggle yeah, with yeah. us filling into existing water sheets. Um, that's problematic, right? Because some of the solutions that you see here, and again, this is another project we collaborated with Stockholm, that requires filling into the water. And so it's proving that current ecological value was low, uh, the, the intervention is going to yield higher ecological value and um, better results in resilience. So it's those conversations and shifting really the parameters by which we've been designing are all happening concurrently right now. Um, I'll add too that the uh, blue line, the MBTA blue line runs under this part of the site. So just adding raising grades is not right. simple because we have to deal with tunnels. Yeah. Um, below ground matter. Um, this is Draw 7 Park in Somerville. It's owned and operated by DCR. Um, this park was identified through Cambridge and Somerville's resilience plans um, along with the Amelia Earhart Dam um, as a critical flood pathway for those communities. Um, that at a certain point the dam is over top of flanked and floods the communities and the MBTA. Um, so they have a separate project, DCR, is looking at what they can do for the dam, um, but flood Floodwaters pass through this project as well. Um, and this project is increasing the tree canopy on the site. It has um, fresh water and salt water uh, wetlands and shorelines. Um, and it has a significant bioretention area sort of dealing with the existing water sheet that flows out um, through the community. Yeah, and in addition to all those things, it was dirty, it had contamination, yeah. it's connecting to the bike ped bridge because you go to Everett, and it had an orange line head house, you know, it's like just, <laughs> if you could find another thing to complicate the project, it was there. It was there. This was one of the sites that was the snow farm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah successful. Um, um, should we, yeah, what do you think? Should I'll just we... do Prescott Park last. Okay. Uh, so Prescott Park, one of the reasons I wanted to show this one as well is that it is a coastal park in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, so we're thinking about sea level rise, but existing groundwater and stormwater on the site is an issue. Managing stormwater and groundwater is a problem and the community already floods because of that. So while it's you know, going to provide that coastal flood protection for future sea level rise and storm surge, most of below ground of the park is really looking at targeted stormwater interventions for that community. Yeah, it's the, it's the lowest point in the watershed of the whole neighborhood, and so we couldn't just protect. It was going to just be cut, and I mean, it already is a bit of a uh, bowl, and so it was interventions that help manage in both directions. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, mostly, I go on. Brian. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Too much to talk about. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. I'm glad there's so much going on in this realm. Um, 
Josh and I usually kick off with a couple questions. Maybe we'll just do one. Yeah, we can maybe see if. And then I don't know if the chat. Chat's been quiet. Yeah, chat has been quiet, but maybe <laughs> let's see. We're so good at explaining things from the other side. Right. Well, if anyone does have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll certainly um, forefront them. Would well, you want to try maybe one thing we could do? We could invite those to join us virtually. If we unshare our screen, we can yeah. see the grid of views. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you'd like to, we can see you pretty well in this room. Uh, if you want to um, put your video on, if you do want to engage with us with a question or comment, we we invite that now and we'll just be quiet for a moment and let people do it. Hi, Josh. <laughs> hey, Christopher. Yes, yeah, so why don't you see if we can do this organically. If, if either of you, Chris or Josh or Gretchen, <laughs> if you can unmute yourself, um, I think you can. And if you'd like to ask or make a comment, you're welcome to. Maybe we have to give you permission. Oh, no, I think it works. Well, I can maybe kick things off. I have a, I have a funny pointed question. When you did when you did the work on the Lango and uh, Pillow Park, did it smell of molasses underground when you actually did it? <laughs> it didn't. Okay. Also, I will tell you, and this, I'll keep it brief because I know we have limited time, but there was a book written um, by a guy that hid um, things across the entire country, Treasure. in, it, treasures Treasure. across the entire Treasure. country. Uh, it was a book written in the 80s, and as construction started, a guy walked up to the fence and yelled to the contractors, I have a feeling that one of these treasures is buried in this park, and sure enough, it was. It was under That's a whole plate in one of the ball fields, and it wow. became this whole National Geographic special. So it was a fascinating process to watch. Yeah, that's cool. Archaeological dig as well as a yeah, lazy exactly. project. Any uh, questions from the audience? Otherwise, Josh and I. It is a lot. It's overwhelming, actually, the amount of things. Why don't you guys get us started? And sure. Let people all <clears throat> on a maybe more on a less less comical one. Obviously, sort of the contiguous nature of the protection is going to be really important. Yeah. I wonder if you can speak to some of your experiences or maybe even strategies if you're working on sites and you have adjacencies. It's actually interesting. Um, I, I lived in East Boston for 10 years, and yeah, all the waterfront development certainly helps, but Lewis Mall, I'm glad to see it's being looked at because it's right. a very obvious critical gap yeah. um, that if everything else was done, it doesn't, you know, water doesn't respect property lines. That's right. You know, rushing in and flood backwards everything. Right. So it's curious how you sort of speak to municipalities or even private landowners about plugging those last little pieces. Yeah, well, actually, in Provincetown, um, we're working on a waterfront park. It's a tiny third of an acre, but it's actually the first along Commercial Street. I mean, everyone has seawalls to varying degrees, but those have sort of always been there, and that's more of a property protection than a resilience strategy. Mm -hmm. So we're actually putting in the first intervention that is designed to be more of a um, downtown protection, and that is not met on either side, right? And so some questions are like, well, why are you doing it? What is the point? And I think the, you know, the answer to the uh, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time is like you've got to start somewhere and you've got to put a stake in the ground. And once that starts happening, I think the social and also I think, you know, scientific pressure, if you will, to start meeting, meeting people where they're at becomes more relevant and more present. So more and more, I think we're seeing private developers, frankly, just from a risk perspective, are buying in. Um, insurance companies are pushing the conversation mm -hmm. uh, as as they are wont to do, but I think the and not that I'm wishing major storm events on anyone, but it's after those major storm events that you see a huge, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can tell people your property will flood if you don't do this, but until they're literally mopping up their kitchen, um, it's hard to understand the direct impact. And I think to your point, Brian, about how do you help bring people along, because in some ways, some folks just aren't going to buy into the for the greater good conversation. It really does come down to, well, this will help me immediately and help all of us eventually. When the downtown floods, even if your house didn't flood, you're impacted. And so the narrative around 
each of us playing a part in this sort of stone soup strategy mm -hmm. is one that we are constantly, you know, recrafting for whoever the audience is. But it's a great point, and it comes up every single time. And, and I think it gets back to the value creation, right? Like, we're not putting up just flood plank here, you know, like, you know, post and log, stop log systems. We're creating value yeah. through the park design, and that's sort of the the additional benefits of we're looking at stormwater, heat, sea level rise, as well as equity, accessibility, yeah. you know, like thinking about how, I mean, there's the, the flip side of the uh, green gentrification, you know, aspect of it, but the, you know, what we're doing beyond just the project but for the community. Um, and the city of Boston does have, that is like one of the reasons for their guidelines that we referenced in Langone and Popolo, is that Langone and Popolo, you know, for the near-term flooding, it goes through the site, but actually further out, it comes off the Coast Guard site and through the DCR yeah. skating rink. Um, so that is part of that strategy is it's adaptable. So it's designed, it was used, designed using 2070 projections, but it's actually not designed to that future DFE level. It's designed to be adapted. DFE is Design Flood Elevation. elevation. <laughs> Sorry, CLA, three-letter acronym. Um, is there something in the chat no, it's just about no, it's credit. Just Sorry, uh, I was going to start. Oh, I think I hear them. I was going to start to write in the chat, but it's faster to talk. <laughs> um, but really, picking up on Brian's point, um, the I am struck that the coordination of this really relies on you, right? It relies on Weston and Sampson, or it relies on the individual consultant. I mean, in a way, very much we're building this, you know, property by property, piece by piece. Um, in a way, it's a much more complicated version of the Harbor Walk, where it's like, all right, everybody, you know, you you build, yeah. it has to be 12 feet wide and you need to meet your neighbor, right? Um, but this is a lot more complicated than that. So I guess my question is, you know, I'll step back and, and you know, wear my um, professional organization hat. My question is, as a professional organization, whether that's BSLA or BSA, you know, as a point of advocacy and awareness, where do we need to be raising awareness or even, um, you know, advocating with our elected officials about this like larger scale coordination? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Gretchen. And I will say that, um, you know, as a landscape architect, I feel like our tr a lot of our training, right, relies on this ability to organize diverse disciplines to come together in a solution, right? And architects as well, typically operating in this sort of prime role beyond contract, but just in general, like how a project gets done. I think if we think beyond the limits of the project, to your point, that we as professionals do have, frankly, a role in, in the societal uh, dialogue about how important and understanding these larger implications is and that funding has to be identified to help support education, communication, and then the actual implementation of some of these pieces in a way that I don't think is happening now. You know, it's like there's a major, a major slide you hear about on the news. People are filing for, you know, damages. There's like some, you know, there's some clickbait-like moments but then it sort of recedes until it becomes urgent again. And so I think that you're right, is that there is a role there um, for us as professionals in a professional organization and network that it selfishly benefits us, right, to raise awareness mm -hmm. and, to, and to create a venue where that can happen, but also, frankly, on the larger societal level, is a pretty important role. Um curious, you, were, you mentioned funding. From a data standpoint, especially now with that modeling you were talking about, is there an ability or do you see a, a more robust ability to be able to sort of quantify the value of a park? Like, you know, there's the cost and everyone's like, oh, it'll cost, you know, $5 million right. to do this or $8 million right. or $20 million to do this park. And then, you know, we're starting to see now from insurance companies, you know, if you protect downtown Boston, it's, you know, this yeah. much economic value should it flood like Sandy. Right. You know, what's the value of a tree in terms of, like, carbon sequestration? Right. It's starting to come together where you can say this, this park costs $20 million, but over the next 10 years it will save the community 
X million dollars. Yeah, I think some of those are more easily quantifiable. Like if it is a flood barrier, there's a clear, you know, protective lens. Um, what it's going to cost us in co-pays for mental health visits? Like I feel like that's yeah. in the gazillions, right? <laughs> like I wish there was a way to, um, I wish there was a way to quantify that. But it's a great point, and I think that there is, I think there are, um, you know, general calculations that could be done to sort of reiterate the return on investment is well beyond what's tangible, um, you know, and what what pencils out. Like what is the pro forma of a park? It certainly has multiple line items that. You know, you could yeah. calculate or not. And I think there are, you know, we're seeing evolving guidance coming from federal, coming from insurance agencies on how to start quantifying this because it's not just as simple as we can use the 2070 event to quantify. Like yeah. we're sort of thinking about that variable risk over time. Right. Um, so we are seeing more guidance come down on that. Um, and it has been used successfully in BRIC applications and, and right. other sort of federal funds of this is the. And BRIC is the. <laughs> Building resilience in communities. Yes, thank you. Sorry. The That's a four letter acronym. Letter acronym. Letter acronym. <laughs> I have one other thought. I don't know if it's necessarily a question, but maybe an invitation for more insights. But the, the I, what piqued my interest was the relationship between the regulatory and sort of permitting environment yeah. and the resilience yeah. environment and right. how certain regulatory restrictions are at odds with how they you are. want a resilience strategy to unfold. So have you do you have any insights about how to navigate that successfully? Yeah, or, or talk to them early. <laughs> yeah, right. They are they are changing and evolving. There is absolutely a recognition on behalf of the regulators that are like, yeah, we know. This is terrible that it's at odds with this, right? And so obviously there are certain nuances to each application where you start to advocate for mitigation or benefit and response to a perception of loss and that sort of thing. But really what it's going to take is a bit of an overhaul of the of the regulatory language because in some cases you really get yourself into a into a place where there's just no you know, there's no diverting. There's no loophole there where you can you can make the argument that the filling in the water course or whatever it is is doable. With all this, so it is trouble, but I think it's it's being recognized. You know, the first step is admitting you have a problem. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're there, <laughs> and I think as it moves, then you know, hopefully that continues to evolve. Yeah, and I found you know in, in working with state agencies and regulatory agencies, they want to see climate resilience projects. Like it's it's a goal of the Commonwealth to promote climate resilience, equity, and inclusion in the money that the Commonwealth is funding. Yeah. So. They're, they're seeing that. They now have the MEPA process is now, um, you know, requiring that you go through the new, the new statewide standards tool that has been launched. And you don't have to say that, yes, you're meeting it, right? But you have to know. Like, you have mm -hmm. to look at it and say, yeah, I acknowledge that climate change is going to impact my project. Mm -hmm. um, and it opens up conversations to sort of what are the changes that are needed. And I think the more ideas, the more innovation, the more test sites, where we can start to push the envelope, that more of that conversation will take place. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, yeah, it's just starting conversations early. Right and now. I think, too, there, there, at some point I'd love to get to a place where there's an appetite or a, or a realization that there has to be room for failure that mm -hmm. we learn from, right? That a lot of these interventions are like, we hope this works. And here's what we're going to propose. And to the best of our ability, we've modeled this out, and it looks like it's going to succeed. But it may be in a crazy storm that something goes sideways. That has to be okay mm. and take the lessons learned and then move forward. I think in many ways, especially engineers, no offense, Julie, yeah. there's <laughs> really low tolerance for risk. And I think in order to break through and really get further faster, we're going to have to be agile and, and a little bit more, you know, innovative. Yeah. That's a good point. I'm always haunted by, you know, what was it, Facebook's original motto, you know, move quickly and break things. And I'm not advocating for that. Yeah, but yeah. I'm interested in that in the private sector, you know, failure, you learn from your mistakes, you keep going as long as you didn't bankrupt your company. It's right. a growing process. And yet, municipal funds, because, oh, you know, we always so want to make sure as a right. taxpayer that yeah. we never misspent, yeah. there isn't an ability necessarily to iterate in the same way and learn uh, right. rapidly. And right. I, I'll say, I think what we can do is rather than make things fail safe, safe to fail. 
And so that's sort of where redundancies come in. Right. And sort of thinking of like, hey, what happens? So like, yes, we're planning for the 2070, but as Sherry, you were saying, when the water crests and goes over the top of the wall or goes through the path, like, what happens? Yeah. If we've reduced the consequences of flooding on that other side of the wall, okay, it got yeah. wet. Like, and sort of mm -hmm. thinking about, like, where are the areas that we can make it safe to fail, right. safe to be exceeded, because I think that also just, it benefits everyone. We hear, it's, we hear tragedies through infrastructure failures all over, our bridge program, our dam programs, like, you know, we put a lot of faith in our infrastructure, yeah. um, but it has to so be maintained yeah. and funded and all of that, and I think that changing that thought that it's safe to fail rather than fail safe will help us push that needle more, too. I want to mug with that on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Josh has his hand up, so let's recognize Josh. Oh, hey, Josh. Hi, how are you all? Um, I, I was waiting for the right time because I have a question which is slightly different. So it seemed like a, the right pause. Um, I, um, I mean, some of you know the work that our firm does, but you know, my my interest in parks as critical infrastructure is really uh, understanding them as as critical pedestrian infrastructure, right? And in looking at you know listening to the conversation looking at the projects you know on the screen and that kind of thing you know there's a there's a grain to you know all of these sort of waterfront projects where you can move along them right and there's obviously a, a hope of you know sort of keeping water out and i was wondering how you approach sort of balancing the fact that you you want public parks to be places that you can just you know, space out for a second and find yourself in them, right? And access them that way, as opposed to I'm making a choice to to go there, right? You want it knit into the fabric of the city as much as possible. Right. And it seems like there's this potential um, conflict where you want this edge to be impervious to water, but you want it to be porous to people, right? And how do you balance those things? Yeah, I think Lane Gone is actually a great example of that where we didn't want to trap stormwater and we didn't want to trap people, right, land side. And so in that, um, the flood barrier, which is the Paris feeding wall, there are these moments, right, the, these breaks in the wall that are pedestrian routes from the street to the water. That path does have a gradual slope that at the back of that path, right at the back of the property line, meets designed flood elevation. And so the park, the whole park, is the flood barrier. And those walls, um, would, you know, they do get flanked. They will get flanked. And that's okay because the park itself is designed to accommodate. Um, but, it, but the places where there are barriers are mitigating wave action and doing other protective measures. And I think that strategy is sort of key in thinking about not designing for the flood and the drop of water and the whatever, but designing for the person, which I always advocate that landscape architects do. You know, the engineers design for the, the, the car, the, the live load, the whatever, and landscape architects are designing for the people, um, is that how people move through the site actually should supersede um, how these other things do the site, but they can happen with equal importance. And those apertures through what otherwise would be a contiguous barrier, whether it's whether it's up and over, whether it's through, whether it's around, those need to be taken as seriously as all these other components. And I think that Langone actually has done it most successfully because of the way that the grades and the wall work together and letting go a little bit of the wall isn't the only answer. Yeah. And it's not the it's not a one liner. It's multiple layers of protection and access that have to knit together to be successful. So your point is an outstanding one, and I think it's a risk, right? Like you know, you hear all the time, like, well, the Dutch they just put dikes around the whole damn place, <laughs> and then you live in the little box when you sort of peek over <laughs> when you or you hike like, up to the yeah, dike to hike it. down right. The beach. And that's not what we want. And that, and I think that there are better solutions that way. I don't know if you have other... I'll just say, I mean, it's been a huge problem with deployable flood barriers in particular in the sense, like, you know, outside this building you can see the, the marked ones where aquafence will come up, but that's all in sidewalks. 
Like, and there's some great comical photos from the city of Boston Public Works of where people are putting out, um, you know, flood barriers to protect their property for high tide events. And you now pedestrians have to walk in the street. Like, it goes, like, around the fire. Like, you're like, how do you access the fire hydrant? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So I walk in the street now because it's the high tide. And so I think that those aspects, like, it is, you know, I know from, like, the work that I've done with the city and the state, like, pedestrian access has to be paramount. Like, we can't make things unsafe to protect property. Mm -hmm. um, people do have to come first. Yeah, and it, it isn't as simple as saying, well, who's out in the park during a 2071% storm? Yeah. It's like, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, there's a before and after yeah. to the storms that's, that's really important. And so what if I want to be in a park during a storm? <laughs> that's when we send people to take pictures, right. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> When you test those boots. Or that's the, it. Wait time. Ding time. Uh, Josh, did you want to uh, engage with those comments at all, or are you, you good? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's helpful to hear. I mean, I think, you know, the idea that the, that the barrier topographically works more like a dune as opposed to a wall, you know what I mean? Sort of helps to, you know, to, to think through it that way. I mean, I think, you know, it, and I think for everybody, like, you know, these liminal spaces of the beach are, they're cool places partly because they're underwater sometimes and not underwater sometimes. And so, you know, I like the idea of it not being so fixed, like this is the public domain and this is the sea. And Great. you know, there's nothing in between. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that, Josh. Mm -hmm. And Christopher, it looks like you have your hand up as well. I do. <clears throat> and this is completely crazy. Um, but mm -hmm. following a little bit from the last comment about falling as a dune, this is a totally biological perspective. If you had a couple of hundred feet, which you don't and you planted it in a biodiverse meadow and you put herbivores, cows or whatever else on it, the soil level would rise at about the same rate that, that um, ocean greenhouse um, oceans are rising, which is to say that that barrier would continue to be almost exactly the same position in relation to the soil, to, to the water level, right. or more or less ad infinitum. Now it's totally impossible to do it. You haven't got the space, and I like you know, it. You're not going to cut off the access to the water, but we have a self-building dike that way. Yeah, I like it. I would, you know, I think if um, Draw Seven would be like a perfect example of a place like that, right? It was, a, it's sort of now that's forgotten because it was used as a snow farm, nobody uses it as a soccer field anymore. And it's like, people do walk along the water, but that's the place where that sort of thing should happen, right? That's where that could be happening, meeting um, those existing grades. Yeah, I think that there have to be more creative and brave um, ways of looking at this because it's gonna take a hundred different typologies to make that work, you know, along the whole edge. And that absolutely is like a, a great one. I, Christopher, you need to get in touch with the Stone Living Lab because they're trying all kinds of experiments out in Boston Harbor, and I like the idea of bringing out. I um, yeah. gave a presentation with a colleague a couple of years ago at a conference, and I can't remember his name. He's Dutch, I believe. He was on sabbatical at Harvard at the semester he was here. Um, maybe you know him. Um, and he has done some incredible landscapes which are basically designed to flood yeah there are these huge parks and people are going on picnics and then in a high water park they all flood they're all designed for that and you know you can't go have a picnic on the grass for a while because it's got to dry out but right. there's some absolutely incredibly gorgeous projects yeah, I think that that absolutely has to be a part of the thinking is that um, while these places certainly are one of their jobs, right, is to provide passive and active recreation, one of their jobs is, is one of protection. And sometimes they're busy doing that. Um, I'll say like from the, the 
time that I've gone over to the Netherlands and worked with um, associates over there, it is exciting. Like they're they're a lot more willing to fail over like try new things, like the whole sand engine that they just dumped a lot of sand rather than doing dredging and replenishing every two years. They figured let's put it all on one part of the beach and let and water let water in. water and wind oh. do its business. Uh, but the big part about it is monitoring. Right to see like what happens, what's happening with the ecosystem, and right. we had a great tour. It's, well, if you go, it's kind of a nude beach, so if we are <laughs> taking photos, you might not be able to share them afterwards. Be ready, be, be ready. Um, but in sort of speaking to people about like new currents that are forming, safety issues with swimming, and sure. but the new habitat species that are um, they haven't seen there before with freshwater saltwater interface. So I think there's so much opportunity for us to learn and have, you know, if we have space to have conversations about what something could be mm -hmm. um, and just see how it goes, right? Yeah. Like, we love to know. We, we love, love to know we love and we want to know so badly. Like as engineers, like, but I, like, that's why I became an engineer. I desperately needed to have an answer to a problem. Right. And then I realized that that's just never going to happen in my whole life. And I right. need to get over Hence that. Hence the therapy. Hence <laughs> the therapy. Right. Yeah. That's, the, that's part of that um, visiting nature yeah. and accepting that change is inevitable and you don't know the future. Everything changes. Uh, but definitely that drive for a number. Like yes. That, yes, I have a number. Yeah. 22.5. That's right. it. That's it. Um, right. It's very comforting. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting pairing when you think about it, because I remember the first time that I was speaking with like a landscape architect, and I have a background in architecture specifically, and they said, you know, your project's done the day, you know, you get your certificate yeah. of occupancy, and that's probably the best it'll ever look after that, it's going to get, yeah. you know, for a little while. And then, you know, you look at the old photos of like the public garden or something like that. Day one of opening is like, it, the vision isn't there at all. So anemic. So it's yeah. interesting because you've got these like hard numbers, and yet landscape work on this long time frame where you don't have control, right? You you plant the tree and you hope it does or right. the ground cover goes where it pleases to some extent. So That's right. it's a it's a it's and an people, odd couple pairing. People are also an unknown. You know, you you think that they're gonna use it this way, but then mm. suddenly, you know, people are their own organism and they start using a park in a certain way and the next thing you know, like the pathways that you've designed are yeah. like, why are you walking? <laughs> I'm not sure if we have any more questions that we're probably coming up on time, but uh, if anyone else wants to jump in, I don't want to sort of cut anyone off. We have 50 sandwiches we have to eat. So. I know. <laughs> we better get started. I've got a couple of examples that I like. I don't know exactly how you make use of them. One is falling water, and you may have seen it, where Wright built a hole in the roof along the edge of the, of the pathway for a tree. Now I saw falling water 40 years ago and the tree was getting pretty close to the size of the hole that he'd left. So he he planted it in 35 or he built the the surround in, you know, had, so I had 40, 45 years or so to grow and it was about right. I expect it's overgrown by now. Um, but that was designing growth into the design. And another one is a church in England, I saw a very long time ago, built of very large oak beams, 15, it was 1500s. And extra ec, recognizing that the Beams were eventually going to fail. They planted outside the church in the grounds oak trees, which in 500 years would be, be big enough to make the beams to replace the ones that, in the roof that they're put in. Brilliant. I like that. Now, how do you put that into, you know, landscape architecture or architecture in general? Um, but it's a very different perspective. There's a, there's a good book about flexibility, like designing with uncertainty in that level um, that talked about how some bridges in Spain were actually designed to be able to add a second deck at some point and mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, what that could look like for transportation and how to, how to model that. I don't, I think that you're right though, it's hard to imagine it as standard practice here, but other other places around the world have sort of looked at it and, mm -hmm. you know, thought about it. It's not the first time. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's some. There's some exciting, like infrastructure-wise. Like you know, we think about a lot of times 
if you have the ground open, do as much work as you can because you don't want right. to open it up again. Put your car so, in now, maybe. Like, right. you know, exactly. like, and Boston Water and Sewer, they're like, we're throwing in a you know 48 inch main because we can, right? Yeah. Like we're because we have the space, we're going to do it because we'll probably need it in the future. Um, but also even thinking about you know, okay, you only need one pump right now, but if you're opening the ground, can you build a second bay for a pump that you don't have to pay for or maintain now, right. but you could add in the future and thinking right. about what that looks like and flexibility. Yeah, those are good examples. It reminds me too, I recently saw, and just pulled up my website to check on it, but the um, Yellowstone is 150 years old this year, and they're offering a special anniversary ticket where you can buy admission for this year, but also for admission 150 years from this oh, year. Oh, how neat. So cool. you get the two, and then you have to use the, you know, you pass yeah, that along generation pass it along. to generation. That's a good wow. yeah. But it, it's the That's idea. Fascinating. I think it's like $1,500 to get that ticket. So it's, oh. it's a fundraising effort. Plus appreciation. Um, over right, yeah, yeah. It'll be a bargain in 150 yeah, years. Yeah, sure. but, but it's, it's that idea of yeah, uh, the legacy, the, I like, the that's stewardship really creative. of the space. Uh, I like that. All right. Fantastic. Well, um, thank you everyone for joining us. I think this has been revelatory, and thank you so much to, to Sherry and Julie uh, for sharing. Sure, yeah. Uh, cool. yes. Thanks for having us. Um, your insights. Hopefully, this just you know further converts people's thinking, and we can all be sort of advocates for right. the open spaces we have, and for adequate funding, and for you know understanding the the multitude of things they provide beyond just sort of the, the right. surface uh, beauty uh, that that we all enjoy. Thank you, guys thank you so guys much. so much. Yes, thank you, you everybody, thank, thank you everybody you. virtually. And uh, again, if anyone is interested, of course, in, in becoming a future co-chair, please reach out to Josh or myself, and we'd be happy to to start that process and, and bring you into the fold. But uh, thanks everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Gretchen. See ya. Gosh, it's funny, when I looked at your last name, I'm like, oh, F-A-I-A. I was like, no, that's his last name. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that was Thanks, good. Thanks, guys. Yeah.